now. Um, one of the people that inspired the wonderful lunch that we just had, the, the uh, Coney Island lunch, um, is Mr. Ashdown. Uh, he's been asked to come and talk about the Ashdown family cottage and their seven generations on Lake of the Woods. So welcome, Bill Ashdown. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, I presume you can hear me, whether you want to or not. Let me start off at the beginning, which is always a good place to start. Uh, I, I'm afraid I cheated somewhat when I put together this presentation. Because with something like 1,200 photographs and slides to play with, I couldn't find just 30 or, or so that would effectively describe all seven generations. I mean, apart from anything else, I'd get too much fighting between baby pictures. <laughs> uh, so I focused on the first three generations, the earliest, and I, I think really the most interesting uh, generations on the lake, the most interesting set of photos. So what I'll show you today will run from about 1885, 1890, to about 1920 or so. Uh, these are early photographs, and so they come with a lot of obvious limitations. There's no flash photography. Uh, there's no video effects. You won't get the clarity that you have on, on modern photographs. There's no interior shots either, which is really disappointing. Uh, of all the interior, of all the, the, the three cottages that we've had over the years, the first two of them, we have not one single interior photograph of any of them. Uh, which really annoys me, but I guess at the, at the time they simply didn't have the technology to, to do the, the quality of photography. But there are some wonderful photographs nevertheless. Let me go to photograph number one. There we are. Every story needs a start, and this is our start. This is my great-grandfather, James Henry Ashdown, the, the founder of the feast, as Dickens would have it. Our history on Lake of the Woods really starts with him. He arrived in Winnipeg in June of 1868 uh, after 19 days walking behind a Red River ox cart uh, from Fort Cloud, Minnesota. Now, th the reason he had to walk was that he literally couldn't only, could only afford to uh, let his bag ride on the ox cart. <laughs> that cost him a few pennies. Having him walk on the ox cart was too damned expensive, so he chose to walk instead. He, he was a tad tight-fisted. <laughs> 19 days and 19 nights spent under a, an ox cart was quite an adventure. Uh, and that was his, uh, that was his introduction to, to Western living, if you will. When he arrived in Winnipeg, the first thing he saw was acres and acres and acres of dead locusts or dead uh, uh, grasshoppers. Uh, we were in the midst of the worst grasshopper infestation in history that year. And there wasn't anything green on the prairie from uh, one horizon to the other. In fact, even the green paint off the buildings had been chewed off by the locusts. It was something really quite disgusting. Because unfortunately, all those locusts, once they die, they uh, <clears throat> smell. <laughs> Hardly an a, a introduction to Winnipeg, but uh, it served him well. It, it showed him what, you know, it gave him a tough time at first. Anything else beyond that was going to be easy. He arrived with a, a handful of silver coins in his pocket. The, pr the proceeds literally of, selling, of his mother selling four silver spoons that would help finance his journey to the West. And within a few years, he established himself as being one of the preeminent businessmen of the region. By the end of the century, he was one of the wealthiest men in the country. He established a store that grew into a chain of hardware stores that became the largest of its kind in, uh, in the British Empire, a total of 250-odd stores that went from Thunder Bay all the way to BC. And some of his other business interests involved places like Great West Life, Canadian Indemnity, the Canadian Fire Insurance, uh, Northern Crown Bank, uh, the Bank of Montreal, and scores and scores of smaller businesses. He was into real estate, he was into gold mining, he was into logging and warehousing, he loved business, and he was into every, everything he touched turned to gold. But interestingly, his, his real passions were social in nature. He was very much uh, a liberal at heart, which is sometimes hard to believe when you look at my family. Um, 
At his death, he was involved with no, lo no less than 35 separate charitable organizations, usually at, at a leadership level. He helped organize the YMCA in Manitoba. He helped organize the Board of Trade, which later became the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he helped to organize the Women's Hostel, the Social Hygiene Association, the Children's Aid Society, the Children's Home, the Salvation Army, the Boys Home, uh, Boys Club, the All People's Mission, and uh, half a dozen separate churches. He also helped uh, establish the Winnipeg General Hospital. So he had a real heart for uh, the social activities and the social concerns of the citizens of Manitoba. And when he left uh, uh, school, he left it at, at the age of 11, uh, he taught himself to, uh, uh, to read and write, if you will, by reading Blackstone, which is the famous old uh, legal text that uh, were considered sort of the, the, the basis of trade for the, for the legal profession in, uh, in, in all of the English-speaking country, uh, countries. Um, he learned uh, his reading, if you will, through hours and hours of reading Blackstone, which is about as exciting as reading a dictionary backwards. <laughs> but it, what it resulted in was an interesting, uh, an interest in education that uh, resulted in him he uh, helping to found Wesley College, which later morphed into the University of Winnipeg, which has always been the family university. And I'm, what am I, generation three as a graduate. Four, sorry, my daughter is generation five. <laughs> Everybody needs a university in the family. <laughs> it always allows you to know where your money is going to go. He spent 25 years there uh, as the president of the Board of Regents, so he loved the place extraordinarily well. So he was a very, very busy man. I mean, he, he was a man who just had an endless number of interests and just never stopped. So he, had a, he needed a place to get away. He needed a place to crash, if you will. And he discovered Lake of the Woods about 1885. At that time, getting down to the lake from Winnipeg was a two-day journey by horse and buggy. It was no fun at all. Very shortly thereafter, though, the railway was completed, and what was two days turned into just a matter of hours, uh, usually in the elegance of the club car. It made quite a difference. And uh, he was one of the very first campers on Lake of the Woods. In fact, family lore says that he was... Uh, the Ashdown family was one of the first two private uh, families uh, summering at Lake of the Woods. And that <coughs> goes back to 1885. The uh, couple on the left were his parents, who were also lake people, uh, somewhat removed. Uh, in fact, he brought them to Winnipeg to live with him uh, when, once he became successful. And uh, they spent many summers at Lake of the Woods as well. And on the right, you can see J.H., that's what we called my great-grandfather, uh, and his wife Susan. Splendid and sartorially elegant. A very important point. He wasn't always sartorially elegant, but he did set a standard. Sometimes he didn't live up to the same standard, <laughs> but he did set a standard. This is a picture uh, of uh, the family. Um, one of those uh, wonderful moments uh, uh, of leisure when they were all swimming. And uh, it really, uh, I, th I mean, I thought I looked bad in the bathing suit. <laughs> My father here has kept up the sartorial traditions of the family. I just wanted you to see that. This is on the occasion of my uh, sister's uh, wedding day at the lake, which happened to coincide with one of the worst storms we'd ever had on Lake of the Woods. But I just want you to, let, to, to know that we haven't lost our sense of style. <laughs> this was our first home on Lake of the Woods. It was on the western point of uh, Coney Island, or one of the two western points of Coney Island. Uh, it's on a property that is now occupied by Sandy Riley, of the famous Riley clan, uh, whose uncle was talked about earlier, uh, being Conrad Riley, the famous rower, great uncle. Uh, this property uh, uh, was uh, built in the early days, at, between 1885 and 1890, and uh, stood for them for years, uh, until around 1905. You can see there the ladies of the family all busy doing something. Uh, I think sorting out blueberries, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> My uh, great-grandmother is sitting on the right there, Susan Croson, uh, who has an extraordinary history all of her own. 
and her mother, Harriet Croson, is standing above her. Now, Harriet was a, an interesting old bird. <laughs> she gave the term battle to battle axe. <laughs> Much to Louis Riel's dismay. You see, she was a uh, wife of a trader in Winnipeg in the 1860s, before Winnipeg, in fact, was Winnipeg. Uh, she met my great-grandfather in the winter of 1868, or it's 69, rather, when he became one of the uh, individuals who was captured by Louis Riel uh, on, the, on the first few days of the Riel Rebellion. Uh, interestingly, my great-grandfather was one of the moderates uh, who was trying very much to find a solution to the Métis uh, Indian uh, and uh, uh, English problem uh, and was unfortunately scooped up with the rest of them uh, at Dr. John Schultz's uh, farmhouse uh, one very cold night in December. He spent the next 60 odd nights uh, as the guest of Mr. Riel uh, in the Upper Fort Garry. Where Mrs. Croson comes in is that she and her husband had the contract to feed the poor prisoners. And Mrs. Croson became one of Canada's first and more successful spies. She developed a spy network that was bringing messages to and from the prisoners on a daily basis from Ottawa. And when you think of the distances in those days, that was quite an achievement. But she uh, organized this little system where she would help truck in the food every day uh, to the prisoners and uh, deliver information that had come directly from Ottawa, two or three days, depending on the, on the uh, telegraph, um, <laughs> and, uh, and back again. Uh, so Ottawa was always kept fully informed of the uh, situation within the upper fort. Her uh, sister, or her sister, her daughter, Susan, uh, came along to help Carrie and, of course, fell in love with one of the prisoners. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> so Harriet was quite a girl, and she, in fact, outlived virtually the entire family, dying at the age of 93. Here's another picture of Harriet in the middle and all the rest of the family behind on what would be a typical day down at the lake, uh, a nice casual day out uh, picking <laughs> strawberries or whatever. And you can tell it's casual because uh, if you look at my, great, my grandfather on the very far side, his tie was very slightly pulled down. <laughs> so you know it's casual day. <coughs> but the, you know, it, 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 it looks almost absurd when you think of summer living now and, and how casual and, and uh, how... Uh, unrestrained we are, but this was a, a, the usual picture of life amongst the middle class in, uh, in those days at the lake. And on the bottom there was my great Aunt Louise. I knew Aunt Louise as a little tiny old lady of 93, but in her heyday she was the troubled child of the family. And you'll see a few pictures of her, she's always the odd person out looking a little troubled and wild around the edges, and apparently she truly was. <coughs> Here's another picture of life in, uh, you know, casual uh, circumstances, uh, life in the bush, as it were. And there, as usual, is Louise at the bottom, uh, being different. <laughs> Holding on to a dog that was named Chiefy. And the reason I know it was named Chiefy is that every one of my great-grandparents' dogs and grandparents' dogs we're all named Chiefy. <laughs> There's about 12 of them. <laughs> At least they were consistent. <coughs> Here's a picture of another old Ashdown friend. Uh, and rumor has circulated around the family that some of the younger members may have had something to do with painting that at one point way back when. Now, you know, there's lots of controversy about, uh, about the devil and uh, who did what to who. Uh, but uh, the best version I could find is that sometime during the late 1890s, a group of young men in the neighborhood decided one night that the devil, being a bare, unfinished rock, was in need of some refurbishment. And this is what resulted. And this picture was taken about 1898, 1899, so what would have been... That would have been a fresh coat of paint on poor old devil. In any event, he's been an old friend of the family for years. Here's another friend of the family. Well, more than a friend of the family. Uh, some of you older residents will recognize the man on the right. All of you should recognize him. 
because he did a good deal of work for you. But that Senator William Moore Benedictson, who was for 25 years your MP, and for another 15 or so, your senator from Kenora Rainy River. And the reason he was significant was that, uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, he's my uncle, because he's my mother's brother. Uh, but secondly, he lived, very, he lived right next to us on Coney Island. And uh, I grew up with his family, and uh, uh, he was also related to the Richardsons. So we lived all along that stretch of Coney Island on the southeast uh, coast uh, together. He, there he is on the, on the left in a uh, much younger picture, together with a very pretty little girl who happens to be my mother. <laughs> Here's a picture of one of the family, or of one of the, the, the neighborhood characters. This was a gentleman named Young, uh, Captain Young. Captain Young had served in the Northwest Mounted Police, the precursor to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And there he is on the bottom right with his wife. And this was a typical picture. You could see him almost every day uh, 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 paddling his canoe uh, beyond our place. His cottage was just uh, several doors down from us. Uh, Captain Young's uh, claim to fame, if you will, was that he was shackled to Louis Riel on the long train trip to uh, Regina, on Riel's trip to his trial and then eventually his hanging. And... Uh, Young apparently told that story relentlessly all of his life, and uh, everybody, uh, you know, they enjoyed all the all the per permutations of it. <laughs> Here's another picture of, or another pair of pictures of the captain. He was known around in the neighborhood as being the man to, to to see when you had to do anything, in terms of wildlife, tree cutting, renovation, whatever. He had great outdoor skills, and was enormously strong, and was just a real character in the in the neighborhood. I love his mustache. <laughs> Although my wife would have different questions about that. Here's a nice, quiet afternoon picnic on the Ashdown front lawn. Actually, it's not. It's somewhere near there, but not quite the front lawn. But this is a nice, casual picnic. You can see most of the gentlemen have their jackets either loosened or off entirely. <laughs> can you imagine living like that? but they all seem to be having a wonderful time. <laughs> and I have to tell you, it's a genuine time, because if you look carefully, there's not a single bottle to be seen. <laughs> My grandfather and the gentleman on the, on the upper left in the white hair, uh, the, the, the very reverent George H. Young, uh, they were all teetotalers, strictly teetotal. Would have no alcohol in the place. And so you can pretty much assure that the party was really a party. George Young was a, also a, a neighbor and uh, another character from Winnipeg. Uh, he was a very well-known churchman in the Winnipeg area. And in fact, he is the man for whom Young Street is named, as well as Young United Church. We were a very Christian family for many years, until my generation came along. <laughs> but uh, for, for a number of years, my great-grandfather was deeply involved with Reverend Young and others in uh, bringing the United Church of Canada to Manitoba. And that's why, in many respects, the uh, University of Winnipeg became the home of the United Church of Canada. They had a good, uh, a very fertile bed here. Here's another picture of the same group, uh, the same party actually, but they're over by the, uh, the lake. Uh, just to give you an idea of the style, a much better uh, definition in this picture, you can actually see what they're wearing. And, uh, there is Mrs. Croson right in the middle, looking as stern as ever, uh, surrounded by all the young people. They never seem to look as though they're having a good time. I'm just hoping they did have one. Here's a picture of them having actually a really good time. <clears throat> now, this picture is not taken at Lake of the Woods because we don't have that kind of horizon. But it's a, it gives you a, a flavor of the times. Uh, particularly the, uh, uh, the costumes and the, uh, the style of beachwear, if you will. There's my uh, great aunt Florence on her knees with her new husband and her sister. Uh, and I don't know where this is, somewhere in the States, I suspect. But obviously having a very good time. But I ask you, ladies, can you imagine going to swim in a costume like that? <laughs> and this is before, uh, you know, this is before nylon and rayon and whatever. That would be wool they were wearing, or cotton. 
interesting stuff. Here's another picture of three beach beauties uh, who are, well, perhaps a little shy. But this was taken uh, uh, in a, some kind of a beach setting. Uh, and I'm told that was beachwear for the day for the, for the, for the older lady. Amazing what they, uh, what they tolerated. But this is my favorite beach picture of all. This really is a good one. If you look carefully, the gentleman on the right wearing the Homburg is my great-grandfather. Standing properly attired for beach wear, for beach activities, with a vest a gold chain, a jacket, and an umbrella. <laughs> he might have been wearing spats too, but I couldn't see them. His wife, fortunately, is uh, standing wearing her, uh, her uh, lo lovely umbrella. But there they are on a beach, dressed in that kind of, <laughs> in that kind of manner. <laughs> when I first looked at that picture years ago, I couldn't stop laughing. But on the other hand, that was the style of the time. That's what they did. And at least they were true to it. Here's a much more casual picture of my grandfather and his three sisters, all four of the offspring of J.H. And this is a very familiar sight for most people from Kenora, because this is where, uh, this is the background there is Stone's Boatworks. It used to sit at the bottom of uh, Main Street. And uh, it was a lovely place. It was even a lovely place when Mars Marine had it, when I knew it very well. Uh, but that was their typical go-to-town dress, to spend some time casually uh, strolling the streets of Kenora. The boat in the background was the, fa the family's first powerboat. Um, I'm just trying to think of its name. Um, but it was, a, uh, it was reputed to be one of the first two privately owned power boats on the lake. Uh, no, it wasn't Chiefy. <laughs> Although it was, it was something just about as silly, and it'll, it'll come to me. Um, but that was the, the beginning of the tradition of owning power boats in the family. And that, uh, I'll tell you, we went hog wild with that. Here's another picture of two Ashdown ladies. Uh, in a moment of uh, repose, as it were. <laughs> Very unlike most of the pictures in the collection, which are quite formal and staged and everything else, these two gals uh, obviously had a clear sense of humor, together with a photographer who clearly did. And something you don't normally see in those pictures. I love it. <laughs> Here's another picture of the local gang. Uh, down on the water, just literally uh, at the foot of, the, uh, of what was then our property on Coney Island, once we had moved from the west side of the island to the east side. The east side is uh, where we were then, is, is now owned by the family called Eccles, uh, and used to be owned for many years by uh, uh, Jim Coyne and his family. Uh, Jim was the Bank of uh, Canada's governor for many years and was quite a famous man back in the 50s and 60s when he picked and successfully won a very major fight with Prime Minister Diefenbaker. Uh, in these days, uh, you know, this was, this was entertainment for the kids, um, and you can see that they enjoyed it. Uh, one other thing, though, you might note, you see the logs in the foreground. Remember, we were uh, listening to logging uh, today, a uh, little bit about logging, and uh, it was very common in those days that logs would come loose from the log booms as they were being pulled into town, and they would end up on all the local beaches. Now imagine hitting one of those at 30 miles an hour at 9 o'clock at night. It would definitely uh, ruin your entire day. <laughs> Here's another picture of my grandfather uh, fishing. Everyone in the family has been, except me, fortunately, has been a major fishing fanatic. And uh, particularly the women in the family, for five generations, all the women love to go fishing. Some of them don't like to clean them, but <clears throat> they all love to fish. That's why they have sons, I guess. <laughs> but uh, this is a, a, a sort of a classic uh, example of, of fishing. And in the old style, where you can see he was using one of the old-fashioned uh, fishing rods that are about eight feet long. Imagine one of those now, 
uh, no fun at all. And I mentioned that the uh, women of the family liked it. Um, this is the famous Norman Dam that you're all familiar with, just after it was opened. And it became a very popular spot for people to go fishing, particularly the Ashdown ladies who would go fishing with some of their friends and set up on the rocks there and have a grand time. But I have to tell you that some of them cheated. They used nets. And I think that's very unsporting. But they used nets to fish. My brother might still want to do that when he gets frustrated, but I've never heard of a, a muskie being caught in a net. But again, it gives you an idea of what people were doing in those days for entertainment and, uh, and how, they, how, they, uh, how they lived. Here's another grand uh, picture of uh, people at play in the water. Uh, life revolved around the water. Everything was the water. The water and visiting. And uh, as you can see, they were enjoying it. Here's a great picture, uh, although it makes me cringe a bit. Uh, of lots of people having a good time and not a single thought to water safety. <laughs> Eight in a canoe, that's, or in a, in a rowboat, that is a little beyond the beyond. But they all look so happy, what can I say? And here are two particularly happy young people. Uh, the man providing the motive power for the boat is my father, was my father. And that was his little brother, Philip, in the bow. And that would be how they would spend their average summer day, would be puddling about in boats in the bays around uh, the cottage. The ideal way of growing up for young kids. And I am so thankful of that because, you see, that's the, the kind of upbringing that he gave my brother and myself and my sister. We grew up just like that, mucking about with boats uh, to our heart's content as we grew up without a care in the world. And it was a wonderful way to grow up and we are so thankful for we've given the opportunity. Here is the family's uh, first boat. Well, actually second boat. You saw the first boat. I don't remember the, the name of the first boat. It was called Cupid. Not quite as silly perhaps as Chiefy, but very close. <laughs> And you can see one of the Ashdown ladies, whether it was Mrs. Croson or who it was, I don't know, I can't see through the photograph, uh, uh, in her canoe. Interestingly enough, all of the ladies in the family for generations had their own canoes. In fact, my grandfather and grandmother, when they married back around 1918, they gave each other a canoe for a wedding present, each of them. Uh, yeah, I guess it's like giving each other a, a sports car now, but... Uh, I think it's classier, a canoe, much classier. Anyway, uh, this shows you what the first boats uh, really looked like. And uh, this is a terrific picture of it. There's a few oddities, though, to these, uh, to these boats that, that made them a little hard to deal with. And this is a good example. There's my great-grandfather in the bow, captaining his boat with his wife behind him, dutifully sitting behind the captain and trying to say nothing. And his young son, sitting behind them uh, again, face towards the camera, looking a little frustrated and perhaps a little nervous. And on the right is the ubiquitous boat boy. Because in the early days, when you had a power boat, you could guarantee one thing. It would stop somewhere. <laughs> and so you had to have a, a, a boat boy coming with you to maintain that engine. And for the first few years, the boat boy was an essential part of boating on the lake. He was the guy who kept the thing going and got you home at night. But you can see, too, when you look, this boat, did, you know, it may have been a very expensive boat from Stone's Boatyard, but it didn't come equipped with anything, like chairs or, or, or seats, for instance, uh, or benches or anything like that. Uh, you brought your kitchen chairs or you stood. And that was the way it was in the earliest of boats. I find that fascinating because, I mean, it, to me, it's just so logical to have a seat. But no, they, they weren't there in the first early boats. 
Here's the old meeting the new, the uh, Athendun the first on the left, which was the successor to Cupid, meeting the Athendun the second on the right, which was like this was, this was rocket technology taking over. This, this was the, the, the space age had finally arrived in the family. Uh, this uh, elderly chugger on the one side and this sleek, uh, uh, you know, beautiful uh, mahogany uh, uh, gas engine uh, beauty on the right. Here's a better picture of it. And it really was a gorgeous boat. I mean, I'd hate to think what they would cost now, but uh, my grandfather loved that boat to pieces. And he had it for 40 years. And it was gorgeous. And it was loved by everybody in the family. Not the least of which was a young man who was my uncle. Who was, he, even then he was trying out for captain. And once again, Stone's Boatyard is in the background. When you owned boats uh, on the lake, <coughs> the boatyard seemed to be an essential part of life <laughs> for a whole lot of reasons. Yeah, we spent an awful lot of time over there. Here's another picture of him, the last in the series, I'm afraid, but very, this is my favorite picture. My uh, uncle, who is now a retired uh, provincial court justice, uh, well into his 80s, uh, was at that time a remarkably cute young man and carrying on the Ashdown naval tradition, which was actually quite a tradition. My grandfather was very interested in the Navy, uh, and my father and my uncle both served during the war. My father spent four years on the North Atlantic um, on board HMCS Skeena, who he used to modestly uh, describe as the ship that won the war. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't win the whole war because it ended up being wrecked in Reykjavik Harbor uh, in November of 1944, and my father and the whole crew had to swim for their lives. And unfortunately, 15 of his messmates didn't make it. He's the only man in his mess who survived. But uh, naval tradition, well, he uh, spent his entire life uh, supporting the Navy. And in fact, we still support the, the Navy League and the museum and all this kind of thing. Some traditions are very hard to lose. <laughs> anyway, that is a, a thumbnail sketch of, of the family from the 1880s <laughs> to about 1925 or so. And it, is, uh, it, it gives you an idea of what life was like uh, on uh, Coney Island, our little corner of it. Uh, our little corner of paradise during those years, and it was uh, it was a lovely place to be. And maybe next year I'll come back and do the next uh, 50 years. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. That was fun. So, Bill, as sure as you can count on uh, summer and s'mores and mosquitoes and all the wonderful things that come with it, you can count on us to tap your well of stories because I think we just scratched the surface here. So. Oh, you, you, you probably did. We're gonna uh, I'm sorry, I, I left before asking for questions. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, or sillier it's the better. see with the light. No questions? No. I do. Yes. Yeah. My, uh, my grandfather, my great-grandfather was born within the sound of Bow Bells in East London. Uh, and his father was born uh, in a little town called North Fleet, which is just outside of London on the Thames River. Uh, so far as we know, every Ashdown that was uh, has come from that part of Kent. And in fact, we've been able to trace our, uh, ourselves back to about the 1670s with some degree of accuracy. Uh, you know, neglecting, of course, the horse thieves and the, all the others. <laughs> I, I must tell you, though, that there was one embarrassing moment of, of genealogical horror, if you will, in the family history that always makes for a good laugh. My grandfather, God bless him, was very, a very upright man and a, a man of great integrity and principle, a prince of the church and a, you know, all this sort of nonsense. Um, he engaged a man, and this is before the war, he engaged a man to go to England and uh, uh, research the family genealogy, just out of pure interest. And off this young man went, and three months later, back he came again. 
and uh, they had a long evening, a long evening meeting in their fire in my my uh, uh, grandfather's library. And suddenly the fire was noticed to be kicked up in the room, and and uh, the young man was uh, sent packing. He was, you know, his briefcase tucked under his arm and clutching a check and a very worried look. Out he went the front door and uh, all of his research apparently was being burned up in the fireplace. Well, my grandfather never really spoke of it, but we learned later that there was a little problem of matching dates. You see, one of the key members of the family had been born 11 months after his father had died. <laughs> Which carries on a family tradition because you know the gentleman you saw there in the second picture, the white bearded gentleman with the rather large wife. Now, they may not have looked pretty hot then, but they were cute kids. Because they got married in July of 1840, I believe. And my, uh, grandfa my great grandfather's older brother was born in uh, <clears throat> December, the same year. Yeah. How's that for these storytelling? Thi these things happen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right.